So, <laughs> hi. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Bergen. It is uh, lovely to see the James Merrill hidden study of 107 uh, behind you. It's very nostalgic. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. So this is, um, this is my, my new book. It's called The Math Campers. Uh, my own novel, uh, it's called These Women. It looks like this. Well, the first thing I'll say is all the dreams are actual dreams. Um, there's nothing worse than a fabricated dream. You can always tell. I normally don't write in first person because of the fact that as soon as you have a narrator, you tend to have somebody listening or there's an implied audience. I just got to soak up in the atmosphere in that house. You just feel like a writer and you feel like you're part of this um, tradition in a community and it feels like the work is important. Magical things happen when you're looking at Meryl's books. Well, it was a really, really transformative uh, residence for me. Um, it, that it might sound like a bit of an overstatement, but it, it, it really wasn't. And Meryl's really distinct imagination was present Thanks. in every detail. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Enjoy Stonington on my behalf. The first writers in residence came to the James Merrill House 25 years ago, shortly after James Merrill's death in 1995. Since then, over 80 writers have visited, staying in his home, a national historic landmark, to work on projects of their own. Thanks to Merrill's generosity, the house now belongs to the Stonington Village Improvement Association and is an ongoing inspiration for writers and poets from around the world. For more information, visit our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Willard Spiegelman, a member of the James Merrill House Committee. I'm speaking to you from the dining room of 107 Water Street, where James Merrill's epic Ouija board poem was compared, it was composed, or at least begun. And it's a beautiful spring day here in Stonington, Connecticut. My happy function today is to uh, have a conversation with Stephen Yenser and Lanny Hammer the distinguished men of letters who made this magisterial volume, the collected or the selected letters of James Merrill, this is the third in a three-part series. At the end of the conversation, we will have time, I hope, for questions from the audience. You can register your questions on the chat function or the comments section of your screen, and we'll try to get to them. I wanted to begin, since I'm sitting here in Merrill's dining room, with a couple of excerpts myself from the letters about his habitation of this wonderful house. In June 1955, he wrote to his friend Claude Fredericks the following. Dear Claude, how nice to have your letter on this flawless day. We bought a phonograph too, not a beautiful one, but better than that crazy brown bobbin of yore. We also bought a beautiful plant stand for the tower room. It is covered with plants and peeping betwixt leaves here and there an object. We also bought a wonderful new mattress and sleep like angels. What else? Oh yes, we have bought the building itself. At least we go today to sign papers. Two weeks ago, strolling out at dusk, Thinking nothing bad, we saw a for sale sign tacked by our door, a four-masted schooner. For sale, get it? That's a parenthesis of his, with the agent's name. Panic ensued. We tried to get hold of old Hoxie and found out all kinds of alarming things, that he is clearing out of Connecticut, that he is mixed up with a scheming widow woman, goes off weekends to Vermont, local papers please copy, with her. Eh bien, yesterday we heard that our offer has been accepted. Anyhow, we have great plans. 
to turn the attic into a gorgeous studio room with lots of glass and big terraces high above everything, black and white linoleum squares on the floor. We are inquiring about for a frugal architect contractor and then paint the building and fix the basement. In short, have something splendid to come home to. We're terribly pleased about it. There is an income of about $1,000 from the little shops below. The taxes are next to nothing. Tra-la, la-la, la-la. He loved making a home of this place. Four years later, it's a letter dated March 20th, 1960, having lived here for several years, he has um, endeared himself and planted himself in the village. And he writes to his mother, Dear Mama, a beautiful sunny Sunday on the surface. We have been caught up in the strong soupy vortex of Hilda's life. Hilda was the woman who cleaned house for him. She came up the stairs Friday after midnight, weeping and bleeding. Her husband, twice her age, had heard talk about her at the Holy Ghost Club on Main Street for Portuguese drinking men and had beaten her up. The talk just may be true. The other man is the mysterious stone deaf English inventor, also twice her age, who bought Bayard Osborne's house and who had come to see David to ask, as it were, for Hilda's hand, saying, there's something in her nature, primitive, don't you know, that appeals to me. Well, we thought we had had it all patched up last fall, but now this is the end. The beauty of life in a small town is that everyone has a little part to play and can be watched playing it by the others. The lawyer the old lady and her son who run the newspaper store, the proprietress of the inn into which Hilda has moved, the priest she will not see, and prominently ourselves. There is also a loathsome high school junior chum of Hilda's who tracked her down to our house where she spent most of yesterday and gave her a priggish bawling out at the top of her lungs. Listen to me, you're married to a man. He's your husband. He got a right to beat you. You promised to honor and obey. Why that guy's so crazy in love with you? It ain't funny. And what do you do? I suppose you think you can. The Englishman, meanwhile, saying in his pursy little deaf voice, Hilda, I don't understand why you're listening to this brat. I had gone to fetch him at his house. He doesn't, of course, hear the phone in pure self-defense to give her another ear, even a deaf one, to pour her sad tale into. I also performed a small errand at the store. She had left home without money and answered the phone at 7.30 in the morning when the police sergeant, whom we had at once notified of her refuge in our guest apartment, called to say her sister in Martha's Vineyard was trying to reach her by telephone. During the few moments we've had to ourselves, she is finishing lunch downstairs now while David calls the lawyer. We return to one another like the characters in Ivy Compton Burnett who remark, it is a scene from real life. Have we ever witnessed one before? He got caught up in the life of the Barrow and the Barrow came to adopt him and accept him. Uh, and one final little thing from many, many decades later, anyone who owns a house will understand this. In 1989, April, he writes to a friend, dearest Brian, back in the old house, for the first few days, I always have the sense of it's looking at me through narrowed eyes, rather as I look at it, appraisingly, calculating what another winter has done to us and how long the new paint job can be deferred. But its gaze this year is curiously innocent. Sun shines on the painted chairs under the dome. A little three-year-old plant, named, I think, Viola, is actually in bloom. And I realize only now, writing the phrase, new paint job, 
that this in fact took place last December. Nothing total, mind you, just some cosmetic work on the window frames and in the big room upstairs. Today, I sit with my heart in my mouth, waiting for my builder, the original builder's son, I should say, who long ago took over from his father, to come and tell me what it will cost to conform to the revised fire code. If I comply, there will be no possible way for us and our guests to go up in flames. Funny how poets are encouraged to take risks. At least that's what all the blurbs praise us for doing when these are increasingly outlawed for the householder. James Merrill was a poet who took risks and the risks succeeded. Let me introduce now and bring to the screen Lanny Hammer from New Haven, Stephen Yenzer from Los Angeles, the uh, distinguished men of letters who have edited this distinguished volume of letters. And uh, they will engage in a conversation I will sort of chime in and kibitz a little bit from time to time, but the show is theirs. But before we hear from them, we'll hear from yet another voice beaming in from beyond. This is a reading of a letter of James Merrill's that was read by our dear friend, the late Sandy McClatchy, seen a qua known for all of this really, uh, at an event in St. Louis in 2015. He's going to read a letter early from early in his uh, relationship or friendship with Merrill. I'm gonna read uh, two letters from the summer to me, because I, I, I didn't have time to go through the other 20,000 uh, today. Uh, uh, 19, the summer of 1973, one in July, one in uh, August. Uh, I think, uh, you'll see the letter, I think for the first time in my life, uh, and certainly the last, I was depressed that summer, and I had gone to see a psychiatrist, uh, to no effect whatsoever. Uh, and uh, I can't remember what really had brought it on, but I, might, I suppose that it was the business uh, of what kind of life do I make being gay? It was all still, even in my mid-twenties, late twenties at this point, it was a trouble. Uh, and I think that's why I went to see it shrink. It turned out to be a complete disaster. Oh, God, I forgot. Because I was assigned to a Yale uh, shrink, and he was literally the younger brother of Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Blonde, California, I fell immediately in love. <laughs> Complicating the problems that I had gone to consult with. Anyway, I, I don't know how much of this I wrote to Merrill, but here's uh, uh, his response to this sort of creed occur. And you'll notice, I mean, the enormous reserves of understanding and uh, sympathy uh, that he draws on. And also, it's something we found in all the letters, how so much of his personality is embodied. It just, the letter isn't just about one thing. He includes a one serious thing amidst other stories of the day. He's an incontinent storyteller, and almost every letter has wonderful <laughs> anecdotes. And like, anyway, this will give you an idea of the kind of book, that uh, big book that will be coming uh, in, a, in a year or two. So this is uh, July 1973. Dear Sandy, I'm afraid I shall have to upstage you where heat waves are concerned. A girl we ran into last night who digs at the Agora, said it had been 111 degrees in the shade there yesterday. And in the sun? Well, her thermometer stopped at 122, she said. And when the mercury reached that point, she applied a cold compress. Not dry heat, either. Pollution sees to that. We keep the tub filled with, for periodic immersion, which came in handy yesterday afternoon, uh, l'air de la rassage, when everybody's water was turned off for 12 hours without warning. A plumbago can look almost reproachful as cat. <laughs> You've had a bad time. I'm sorry, I had one last Christmas, the first in 10 years, and didn't really pull out of it until April. That is not to upstage you, just to show that I understand. What is the cure? Work, as the unhappy girls of Chekhov keep telling us. <laughs> Easier said than done. In retrospect, I think, from what I've seen of you, it might well be the case. 
that these are growing pains. <clears throat> Certainly they have everything to do with the sense that the life one has arranged to live is intolerable, mm -hmm. that a skin must be shed, that something more is in motion than the manic depressive pendulum so familiar to others. Others, in fact, <coughs> become suspiciously two-dimensional during these spells. And this is a kind of hell for sociable types like you and me. One resents having to spare them, or resents even more if one turns to them for help. The, the, the way one's black mood seems positively to settle their stomachs, like Ferne Bronca. <laughs> but if the point is to change, to be changed, how else can this happen except by learning to recognize among thousands of objects which few have secret meanings for you? And to trust them, they being you. Um, they being the only ones that can't to, to, to the degree that their value lies within you, betray, their, betray the trust. By objects, I mean people, mainly. As in that passage in one of the Oz books, when Dorothy finds herself in a palace crammed with a bee below, only seven of which are the enchanted king and his family. These turn out to be seven purple objects, as you recall. Something like that, in any case. As for trusting me, of course you can. But you will have to trust yourself even more. Since getting here only eight days ago, I've kept busy trying to do a bit more with Urania. David Calstone thought it was condescending toward the Greeks. My nephew Robin said it was cruel, not his kind of perception. I suspect it belongs to his latest companion, a girl from San Francisco who I quite like, actually, though she's overweight and bald. Uh, they were in Venice and are now in a cave in Santorini. Still a helpful reaction. Things mustn't always go without saying. Things in a poem, I mean. And I've set about blending in a non-euphoric visit below stairs to the parents feeling anxious and homesick. Your remarks help in another way. We all need encouragement and praise. Three o'clock, time for cottage cheese. Unavailable here, but easily made. If it helps to write me about your troubles, don't let shyness hold you back. In fact, remembering Nancy Mitford Cedric, is that his name? In his, at his first appearance at the Montdors, perhaps you'd do well never to mention shyness again. And if you'd rather I didn't comment another time upon what you tell me, I should understand that very well. Bless you, my dear. James. Work, work, work. There is a lesson right there. Lanny and Stephen, welcome. I'm handing this over to you. But before I let you talk, I want to read just a sentence from something that I saw earlier today. This is an article, it's a review really, by Adam Gopnik in this week's New Yorker about a writer. And he talks about the extraordinary, the extraordinary flow of the writer's letters, which are effortlessly parenthetical, sliding into digression and back to the main point with the skill of a rally driver dipping in and out of traffic at 100 miles an hour. The writer, Marcel Proust. <laughs> the writer, James Merrill. One could apply the same uh, comment to. Thanks, Billy. Um, <laughs> hi, Stephen. Hello, Lenny. Yeah. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Yeah, yeah. It, it's been a long time. So um, we thought that we would share some some favorite letters and uh, and take turns doing so. Um, and I get to go first, so I will. I, I wanted to make some selections that uh, showed how much fun there was in James Merrill's letters. That is um, letters that are about fun and letters that are fun. Uh, and letters that are having fun with, in particular, the form of the letter. Uh, writing in Athens, 1964, 17th of November, to Daryl Hine, Merrill's friend, protege, fellow poet. He begins, Calais, short for Calimera, bonjour, my friend. David, David is upstairs with a commando named Nico, out of bed with whom I have just reeled, taking photographs, 
to document an organ all but unprecedented in the experience of yours truly. <laughs> now that I've calmed myself by playing very much en sourdine, some three-part inventions, I find my thoughts winging like a Pompeian phallus in your long neglected direction. And so he continues. Can you imagine opening that letter, being, being thus addressed? It's a wonderful letter in which he describes uh, his new amour, uh, who happens to be Stratomuflozelis, in some ways the grand passion of his life, uh, a character through many pages in this book. Um, Merrill likes to play with, you know, uh, address, um, with how you get into a letter. Um, yeah, indeed, those, those parts of the letter that in some ways are most formulaic, beginnings and endings, he's always doing something with. Uh, tweaking, um, playing. Uh, sometimes the letter itself takes the form of a kind of prank. And um, I've got a couple that I enjoy, um, which I'll share with you. Uh, here, he is writing to his friend, I'm not sure how close a friend, I, whom he has met at Harvard, named Lawrence Scott, who left Harvard in, in, with, with a certain kind of scandalous um, cloud that, that the editors could never really annotate. Uh, but uh, you may enjoy this letter as I do. Uh, it is addressed not, in fact, to Lawrence Scott, the recipient of the letter, but rather, Dear Miss Moore. Uh, that is, the fiction of the letter is that uh, he is writing to Marianne Moore. He says, when a letter from you, actually from Lawrence Scott, comes out of the blue, it's a red letter day indeed. I feel doubly remiss about letting you hear from me but there's been so little news of the kind I can entrust to the males. Were we but alone together, or with Lawrence S. as a discreet third, I could do my bit towards keeping vos jours en feu. Uh, I say keeping because Lawrence Scott has clearly spared you nothing of his, shall I say, activities, and so on. Uh, Merrill's having a lot of fun uh, here, imagining the primus more as uh, the recipient of his scabrous gossip uh, with with uh, with Scott. Um, it's a letter that he he ends up signing in Greek. Um, it's full of fun. Um, here's a couple more. This is this is I'm jumping a few decades ahead. I'm um, now reading a letter from April 4th, 1984. The recipient is Peter Hooten. Peter uh, is, in 1984, um, a not just a new acquaintance, but uh, the man that James Merrill has fallen in love with. This letter uh, to Hooten from Merrill is actually signed by Merrill's typewriter. And it is in fact written from by his typewriter. Dear Peter Hooten, I am JM's new typewriter and want to thank you for those minutes in your arms yesterday. They, far more than the extension cord found in a drawer this morning, account for the electric current flowing through me. Please, Come back again soon and hold me. If you can't write a poem to me, write one with me. The touch of your fingers in the shop, but don't let me go on this way. I must be institutional, brusque, modest, impersonal, big time, monotonous, invincible, bachelorette machine, as befits my monogram, IBM. JM loves you. That's enough. I wish you joy. Sincerely, Ida Bell Morgenstern. 
And now, uh, just flipping back four decades to 1953, to the second piece of correspondence between Merrill and Jackson, uh, and the first real full-length letter that Merrill writes to Jackson, we get another kind of prank, uh, also full of fun of different kinds. Dear Uncle David, the letter, it should be said, is written in not Merrill's adult hand, but rather a child's looping script. How shall I begin to describe the many mishaps and adventures that befell me since parting with you this afternoon? Well, first I got a ride from three boys, only about two miles, but they told me I had a better get a good ride before dark fell. And there's all sorts of um, misspellings and so on in this, or I would be out of luck. Then a Navy man picked me up. Oh, no. Before that, an old man wanted me to get into his car, but I saw the half-empty whiskey bottle on the seat next to him and remembered what you had said about old men. And as he wasn't going far anyway, I thanked him politely and said I would try to get a better ride. Merrill is, um, in this letter, narrating what is probably his only experience ever, hitchhiking. Uh, <laughs> on Long Island from Fire Island where he's he spent the afternoon with Jackson and now he's he's going out on the island to visit his father. And the letter is in fact coming from his father's house in Southampton. Um, it's all written in um, this mock child's voice. But then there's a, a, a PS. <clears throat> uh, it's signed incidentally Jamie which is the pet name that uh, that uh, Jackson called Merrill. Uh, in this postscript, um, Merrill says, morning now, I've slept 10 hours, the day is fine. I love you, David. These have been strange and wonderful days. It's nearly Wednesday or so it seems. I love you. Not everyone loved James Merrill at every moment. This is true. <laughs> These letters uh, are full of friendship. Um, the book is a kind of monument to friendship, I think, in certain ways. And yet, um, uh, part of being friends is, is conflict uh, and friction. And Merrill was always up to it. Uh, let me just show you a couple samples. Um, this is, well, uh, this is, this is uh, quite a strong letter. This is to his mentor, Keeman Fryer, in April. Oh, excuse me. Not April. The 4th of July, 1962, which is important. It's Independence Day, right? <clears throat> He's writing to Fryer, who's written to him an accusatory letter. Dear Keeman, the wiser response would no doubt be silence for you to interpret as you choose. But there are certain things I prefer not to leave unsaid, if only for the sake of my own self-awareness. I mean, I'm not counting on your faith or interest. Your letter eats to the bone. It is so much what I thought you would say. Thus, in a sense, it must be what I hoped you would say. It confirms in me a respect for you, which you imagine I do not have. You are managing to be yourself. It's what we're all trying to do. <laughs> And he goes on, um, you are managing to be yourself and it's what we're all trying to do. I think I, uh, that, that's, that's a kind of ethical um, affirmation that I, I think since editing this book and, and, and reading Merrill's letters, I've tried to keep in mind for myself. Um, 
one more such letter where Meryl is um, confronting a friend, a dear friend. Um, this is a letter to Irma Brandeis. And again, um, as in the last letter, as in the letter to Heim, appreciate the force with which the letter begins. Irma, my dear, let me still call you that. I wish I didn't have to hunt down the grain of truth in your letter. I feel that nothing has changed my affection for you. Yet something clearly, and what, if not my words and actions, has allowed you to read that affection as one more synonym for neglect. This is almost more than I can accept. But I feel awkward now and must try to avoid all forms of protestation, including the catalog aria of dear ones who have come to share your view. <clears throat> so complex, uh, so frank, uh, so um, in a sense, there's a kind of offering of himself, even in contention, that is as intimate and open as, um, as warm affection. And the letters are full of warm affection. I, I, I've gotten excited reading these passages, um, and you two are, are, are listening quietly there and smiling in, in your way. Um, well, I, I was afraid that when you were reading letters of conflict um, with friends, you were going to read one of the ones in which he chastens me yeah. for. Uh, okay, wait, that's, that's here, Stephen. Hold on. No, 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 that's all right. It's, you, it's my turn almost anyway. Uh, but I mean, you're you're so right about that. Uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't afraid of anything. Um, he wasn't afraid of repercussion. Uh, I uh, I didn't don't, don't want to cut you off. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm I'm still trying to figure out how to how to follow that up. Um, well, that's I, that's I'll tell you what, Stephen. I've got, I've got a couple more short passages. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I I enjoy not doing anything. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. well, we're not going to let you not do anything. So hang on there. Prepare to do something. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just meant I enjoy listening to you, Lanny. I wasn't. That wasn't a dig. I'm sure you enjoyed listening to me. Yeah. Hey, um, uh, let's see. I, I wanted to get a little bit more. Uh, a little more. <laughs> of Merrill's outrageous intimacy, really, uh, into um, our presentation today. Um, this is a letter to Tony Paragori, his friend in Athens whom he adored, and um, with whom he has the kind of a, a, a correspondence that, it, that is um, so intimate um, and just rollicking, I think, would be the right way to describe it. He is just, he is, he is um, writing here um, from Santa Fe, where he has been with his friend, David McIntosh. And um, David has been interested in someone else besides Merrill. This is deeply disappointing to Merrill. And yet Merrill has met this other person and he's found that this other person to whom um, uh, David is, is more drawn at this moment, um, and he's found him to be utterly ordinary. Uh, and he, he's, he's rendered in this letter to Tony, you know, in, in a, with, with a kind of, a, uh, all the details uh, of his ordinariness. <clears throat> and then, uh, which is a very funny passage. And then, Merrill says to Paragory, I hope you will believe how innocent my malice is, Ofo. It is, and I'm having the time of my life. You may share this with David, but please with no one else, knowing as you do how paths will cross in this world. The other fellow has gone back to Denver Will he quit his job or suffer a removal to Montreal? Meanwhile, 
I read and write and play Scarlatti on the little upright organ, the only one I have touched, apart yeah. from my own, for six whole weeks, and cook and count my blessings. He signs off in this outrageous way. Robin and Michaela, whom we've heard um, characterized earlier <laughs> as fat and bald, <laughs> cruelly, were here for a visit. I quite took to her in every way, even her vegetarian habits. I think of you every day and love you dearly. I kiss Madame's hand and that little modest rosebud between your so reduced fesses. Right again. X, 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 Jimmy. Very nice. Let me, let me uh, stop talking and reading and let you take over. Well, thank you. Uh, I think I've just uh, changed my mind about what I'm what I'm going to read. Um, this is a letter from um, May 1972, and it's it's to me, um, and it's about uh, going up to see uh, an exhibit. Uh, an art exhibit um, in a in New York in a, in a friend's friend's flat, uh, but then it it goes uh, a long way from there and it covers a range of subjects and and tones, uh, and that's why I'm going to going to read this one. Um, there's a point at which you might want to send the children out of the room. Uh, he. He enters the, uh, he tells me that he has entered the, the room where the exhibit is, the showing of, of pictures. In the room, wavering through marijuana fumes, some other people were distinguishable. Uh, a boy with a ragged orange beard, a rather spectacular black man of about 40 dressed in purple velvet trousers, red windbreaker, a jaunty beret, it was into his hands that the pictures had fallen. Weird, primitive, carefully painted idealizations of motherhood or education. None like girls sitting under portraits of Alexander Graham Bell or pink faced children with axes in their hands. Astronautical fantasies, the planet Venus as a green-lipped starlet. Where the artist was, no one knew. Some local insane asylum seemed a good guess. I've had some life, said the black man, sitting down to talk with a fresh joint. I've killed a man, spent 20 years in prison. All I really know how to do is fuck. Yeah, I've traveled, been to Arkansas, California. I just got back from India, said the orange beard. You wouldn't believe some of the things I've done, the black man went on. Man, I used to deliver ice in this neighborhood, and one evening this man said to me, want to come in for a while? What for? I asked him. Well, says his wife, this is the guy, do you understand, this is the man um, who has the, the picture speaking. James is just telling the telling the story about him. Want to come in for a while? What, what for? I asked him. Well, says his wife, I've cooked some beans. Beans? Man, those two were fart smellers. <laughs> I sat down and ate beans. Then they had me lie down and told me I'd get 25 cents a fart. Put their heads right under the covers. <laughs> I must have made ten dollars and fifty cents that night. This is James again. I said goodbye round about then and went to Elizabeth's for lunch. This is to Elizabeth Bishops from the from beans to Elizabeth Bishops for lunch. A simple Brazilian meal of rice and black beans. 
She gave me copies of two ravishing new poems, the first in what must be years. You'll see them. I almost didn't tear myself away, but did, and met a mysterious stranger, as we'd agreed, in a record shop. We walked to Longfellow's garden. He had, in fact, something of Edith and Allegra from the children's hour about him. Long blonde hair, aquamarine eyes, Larry by name. He told me at some length about his four years of yoga, during which he's never been ill, has overcome all fleshly desires, and lives, even while teaching Greek, he's a junior fellow at Harvard, in a kind of perpetual ecstasy. I've learned to direct energy to different parts of my body. I can even transfer energy to friends far away. That's what one likes about the whole business. It's so immensely practical. I told him in turn about my 10 days of TM, Transcendental Meditation, and he said, yes, that's why I spoke to you. I never wanted to talk to any of the other poets, but I could tell that you were full of happiness. So it showed, James says in parentheses, that it did rather please me. When we parted Subway, he reached into his wallet and produced not his address, which would have been vulgar, but a heart, a small heart of shiny red paper. That evening, I peeled the backing from it and stuck it in the notebook you gave me. The whole day, I mean, was a miniature divine comedy. The morning's inferno, Elizabeth's lunch by way of the truly human element, and finally that hour in eternity. James was so into transcendental meditation that it's, it was hard for some of his friends to believe, but it was a kind of warm up really for the Ouija board experience with the, with the other world. Then I'll, I'll finish this with a um, passage that I read earlier uh, in one of these events, but I so like it that I think it, it's worth repeating. I mustn't tell you, he says it's been a miniature divine comedy up to here, but I think the the, uh, the Paradiso uh, it lingers in this next paragraph. I, I mustn't tell you how happy I've been. It might imply too much about whatever I'd been before. Also, you may have the sneaking suspicion that happiness isn't altogether right for you. And yet, everything I could possibly want seems to be here, within me. You are within me, shaking your head, skeptical, or at least bemused. Poems seem to hang within reach, slowly ripening. No more nervous shaking down of sour green apples. They'll wait and grow delicious. If something else gets felt, a sadness, a solitude, it's more like the sweat on a piece of chilled sweet fruit. It's a feeling I've known before only from the relatively few minutes, perhaps an hour's worth in any given year, of absolute absorption in work. Or, from those other times, familiar surely to my best reader, when the wheel, so to speak, is taken. It's love I'm in now, I suppose, but love that for once doesn't depend on another person, that fallible God of Borges. It's not really love for myself, even except as the vehicle for the angelic chauffeur. There, I've gone and overstated it deliberately. You mustn't take it too seriously. Neither must I, he says. Uh, he ends by giving me the number of uh, the Transcendental uh, Meditation Specialist uh, in Los Angeles uh, and tells me that I had, had better call them uh, as, as soon as I can. So um, that, that's a letter that, that covers a range of tones, I think. And the thing about, as Lanny was saying earlier, is 
so many of the letters cover a, a great range of tone and subject. All goes in. There's a little poem by Hullalin. It, it, it says, and it's a law that everything goes in. And that's true in James's letters. It's a law that everything goes in. Uh, and uh, I think that last moment there of, yeah, I learned a new word the other day. Um, it's apricity. Do you know apricity? No, nobody knows that precity, but I don't know how we do without it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the moment of full ripeness in things, so that apricot mm -hmm. comes from the from the same root, mm -hmm. apricity, when things come fully into d the developed stage, and that that last bit there, uh, where he is so pleased with things and feels that poems are just hanging like melons or like apples from the trees. That seems to me a moment of apricity that I wanted to uh, wanted to, to end with today, perhaps redundantly. <laughs> Speak to me. Stephen and Lanny, I wonder whether you can comment on something that occurred to me when Stephen was reading his letter. Um, letter letters come in all kinds of forms and good letter writers come in all sorts. It seems to me that a poet's letters, especially Merrill's, are distinguished by the use, almost unconscious use, of metaphors like the apple and the fruit business. And these come up unannounced as though it was perfectly natural to think in terms of metaphor, which is one of the things that are crucial, of course, to a poem. So a poet is someone who cannot not think of metaphor even if he's not writing a poem, but just writing a, an ordinary account to a friend of, of something else. Um, the other thing that occurred to me as you were talking, especially Lanny was talking about this, um, a letter is always addressed to a specific person. It is not a pronouncement to the world at large. And therefore the tone of the letter and the content of the letter might have something uh, particular or peculiar peculiarly apt to the recipient of the letter. So every letter is unique and the tone of every letter is unique. And yet, as in a biography, when you look at a, a person's letters, you see a kind of wholeness develop. Al Alani was talking about different voices and Merrill was always interested in other voices. And you hear these different voices come in all the time. And yet you realize it's one voice you know it's it's james merrill and i read this reminds me of the wonderful moment at i can't remember where maybe at the end of mirabelle where he uses the the symbol m slash e for mirabelle and ephraim but they're me you know, mm -hmm. all him <clears throat> uh, it, it's just a remarkable gesamtkunstwerk i mean it's everything it's the whole universe in a kind of nutshell, or a universe in one case, in these cases, in a letter. Well, it's a whole world. Uh, well, <laughs> as, as, as you've been saying, yeah. Uh, there's a nice little story that I, I wonder, um, it's very quick, uh, that, that M-E thing. Uh, in the course of things, uh, he was sending a few poems out to a few people, and he sent out to uh, a few of us, uh, a poem from that last, a poem from um, a part of Changing Light at Sandover where he notices that E, uh, Ephraim that is, is the master of ceremonies. Uh, and Alfred Korn, uh, who uh, got, got the letter, re responded to, to him and said, well, uh, you know, uh, E equals MC squared. <laughs> uh, and James immediately uh, adopted it. Uh, he loved it. Uh, later on, when he started writing scripts for the pageant, I pointed out to him that uh, the relationship between E equals MC squared and light, which is a part of that equation, and he was, he was delighted again. Uh, because of the role light plays in the changing light at Sandover and one of the angels, Michael, is closely associated with light. Uh, and he made use of that too. And everything, when he was writing Sandover, 
everything that anybody said that could help in any way came into it and he used them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is another aspect of the, the wholeness of, of, of the letters, but that gets us off too much into the poems, I think. Uh, well, let me, uh, let, me, let me just um, respond to the first part of your comments, Willard, uh, by saying that uh, Stephen and I are sitting in our studies. You are sitting in a poem. Mm. <laughs> That is to say, you are you're sitting into an environment that has been um, that is seen and understood and created as a whole kind of mobile uh, set of metaphors, uh, and that in fact then get worked into poems and so on and so forth, um, and that that is a, a turn of mind that um, Merrill lived with constantly in all environments, whether it was on Water Street or not. Uh, whether he was writing a letter or not, but it's there all the time in his letters too. He he says someplace that uh, that's an interesting interesting Pharisee. He says someplace that a poet, of course, can't be a hero of any kind. He's never a man of action or she. Uh, poet is a person choosing the words he lives by. Uh, and. Um, I guess also uh, James's house reminds us that the poet might be choosing the words and the things that he lives by too, because all the things there in 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 his right. house in Stonington are things related to the poems. Well, it's it's interesting, and many people who are listening to this show or this series of shows, many people have been to the house. Many more people have not. I hope that in the future it will be more open to people. But the one interesting thing about it is that. It is quirky. It is not grand by any means. This is a man of means who could have afforded any house he wanted. But he wanted this place in which he could park himself in odd positions. So I'm sitting in the, in the dining room with a view out to the water, but the study is this little closet behind me, behind a fake bookcase or a swinging bookcase, the kitchen to the left of me, which had, even by the standards of 1995, when he died, very primitive equipment in it. The kitchen has, as I think no other poet would ever have done, the kitchen has the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize and the uh, other, other uh, accolades and honorary degrees just tacked up by the sink. Uh, this was not a fancy man at all. But every object, as you say, can be compelled or persuaded to have meaning for him. And that appears in the letters as well as in the, uh, in the poetry itself. The, the study there, too, is so small. Mm -hmm. The study is hidden off behind a bookcase. And it's, it must be about 10 by 10, 12 by 12, maybe. Oh, much smaller than that. Okay. Okay. There's a, there's yeah. A, there's a day bed in it. You know, that's. Yeah, that's that's the, right. Yes. Yeah. But nothing else. Yeah, he used to chastise me. I, I had an ordinary size study in a very ordinary size house, very modest. And he said, you know, you could make two rooms out of this if you just put a partition in. <laughs> I wonder, which is what he did in Key West. Well, I wonder if you. And the Athens house, which I never saw, you saw it, was equally quirky and equally small. Oh. Absolutely uncomfortable. Perfectly Greek translation. He had a little, uh, there was what used to be a washerwoman's room. He had a washerwoman on, on top of the house on a uh, terrace that was the roof of the house. And it was smaller than the study, Willard, that you have there. And we're just describing for us. There was room for James and a desk and a typewriter and Auden's OED. Uh, which he had come into, all 26 volumes of it. Uh, and there wasn't room for anybody else really in the study, and that's where he worked. He went up to, to the, the top of the house and closed himself off and worked right there inside his own head. That's right. He closed than his head. himself off from the world, but that's then invited right. the world into his head and into his space. There was something, I don't want to be Freudian about this, but this desire to return to a kind of womb-like situation, I'm sure critics made much of this. Well, he, 
Uh, yes, well, he did it in the first place. There's a poem called The House in Athens, which mm -hmm. describes the place that we are now talking about in some detail. All his houses got into his, his poems, mm -hmm. just like all his friends got into them. Uh, the, yeah. Uh, we've got so much going on here. He, but this, in a way, it's right. Uh, um, James was always, he, he would go right to the heart of things for him, but that the heart of things was many things. He was always going for the jugglery, you know. Uh, just uh, one brief observation from me, which is that uh, given that there's not much wall space in his house, it's interesting that he hung every prize. Did he? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> the, the, uh, no, I mean, you know, the, the, there was an area for his prizes, and, <laughs> and, the, the kitchen. Were, and it, it was the kitchen, and it was, and it was dark, uh, but there it was. Uh, and uh, uh, the drive and ambition, and uh, I think the, you know, satisfaction uh, that he, he felt uh, uh, with his work was was uh, important. It, I, it, yes, it, 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 it was, but you know, I never, I never heard about those wards at all. And he never wrote, he never wrote about them. I mean, that's not true. He, he, uh, he would write, especially to other people about the awards that I got, but he was one of the most self-effacing people I've, I've ever known. Mm -hmm. He had many faces and, and some of them quite bold, but he never talked about his awards, at least to a lot of us. Maybe he did to other people. They were in the kitchen. They were in the kitchen. That's right. You know, uh, before we, uh, I don't know, maybe there's some questions we should turn to. Um, there, um, We're pretty much uh, out of our time, and we also have some more Sandy minutes, I believe. We oh, do. you're right. Yeah, we want to hear that. We do, and I, there are various comments here. There's only one real question. I don't know whether that can be answered briefly. And the question is, uh, uh, Lanny had commented on the letters as a testimony or a testament to friendship. Can we learn from these letters how to uh, implement uh, things <laughs> in our own relationships to improve our own communications? I don't think you can learn anything from literature myself. Uh, or not in any didactic way. I disagree, Willard. Uh, these letters are a great guide to friendship. I mean, uh, they are. I mean, uh, you, you see him maintaining correspondences with Stephen. With, and, and can you imagine how difficult it would be to maintain a correspondence with Stephen for, you know, 25 years, yeah, but, no. but there he is doing it, uh, and and with and with so many other people, uh, and often and with all sorts of changing circumstances in their lives. Uh, yeah. I, I actually think that that um, as I said earlier, uh, the letters are a kind of monument to friendship, uh, and its vicissitudes and the ways in which uh, it can last and matter. Uh, the very last uh, line of his um, uh, collected poems is uh, the laughter of old friends. Uh, and uh, there's enormous value uh, in, uh, in friendship for, for James Merrill. And, and, and I think the letters are, are wonderful, um, you know, um, exemplar of that. So the, 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 the lesson is don't lose your friends, don't drop them, but keep writing to them. Or keep the lines of communication open. Absolutely, it could be as simple as that. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna end our show right now, going back to the, our dear friend Sandy, with one final uh, reading again from St. Louis from six years ago. This is month later. I, I found it must have been this, you know, tossing and turning on the same couch. <laughs> Dear Sandy, a day for Sunday, a day for letters. The one David is writing downstairs begins, after many a summer sighs the duan. Uh, it is as long as a summer, as it is long, it is as long a summer as I can remember. 
One day after another of cool Meltini, ghastly for the people who charter yachts, heavenly for us. We don't even go to the beach, partly because David is having miserable headaches, which sun aggravates, partly because I'm content to stay in my study. Evenings are quiet, too. Wine no longer seems to agree with anyone, and restaurants are so absurdly crowded. The iron gates of life have seldom seen such traffic, to judge from <laughs> the confused rumor that reaches us here in the shade of the pearly ones. The real absurdity, you will say, and I'll agree, it's all still so novel, is to feel in one's bones how utterly a boundary has been crossed. Here one is in later life, and it's perfectly pleasant, really. Not for a moment that garden of cactus and sour grapes I'd always assumed it must be. <laughs> oh dear, this sort of thing is probably just what you mean by my being recessed into myself. At least I can't imagine what else you mean. But it's odd. I mean, the times of greatest recession into the self have always been, for me, times of helpless suffering, such as you're going through, when there's no escape from the self. Perhaps any circumstance, any frame of mind, content, pain, Trust, distrust, is a niche that limits visibility, both for the occupant and the onlooker. I read your last letter in any case with pangs of recognition. There's no special comfort, is there, in being understood at times like these. One is so mortified by one's predicament, and at the same moment so curiously proud of its ramifications. <laughs> you won't be ready yet to like the fact of belonging to a very large group. Uh, who've all had, allowing for particular differences, the same general experience. Later on, when your sense of humor and proportion returns, that fact ought rather to please you. To have so shared in the, or at least a, human condition. <laughs> Write me as much or as little about it as you see fit. As you say, the particulars should probably be saved for the couch. Don't waste time feeling superior to your doctor. You are no doubt cleverer and more presentable than he is. But with any luck, he knows his business, and the shoes he is making for you will last and last. Also, don't be too hard on yourself if your work suffers, if your thesis mulbers or your poetry congeals, because right now, your task is the other matter. The other evening, we made an exception and went next door to meet Alan Anson's house guest, a Mr. Burroughs sallow, nondescript party who talked of nothing but drugs and sex crimes. Just like my mother's Atlanta friends. <laughs> Alan seems to have been very helpful in putting together the manuscript of a book this man wrote, The Nude Meal. <laughs> Indeed, still had the manuscript, which Mr. B came all the way to Athens to repossess in order to sell it, Nampour Qua being marketable nowadays. Luckily, dear old Eddie Gaythorne Hardy was there. He told a story about a chair he'd had recaned at great trouble and expense, then thought of it and said, I wish somebody would recane me. <laughs> that will be all for now. Good luck, James. <laughs>
that Merrill's really distinct imagination was present in every detail. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> Bye. Enjoy Stonington on my behalf. The first writers in residence came to the James Merrill House 25 years ago, shortly after James Merrill's death in 1995. Since then, over 80 writers have visited, staying in his home, a national historic landmark, to work on projects of their own. Thanks to Merrill's generosity, the house now belongs to the Stonington Village Improvement Association and is an ongoing inspiration for writers and poets from around the world. For more information, visit our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. Thank you.